What up, y'all? Rap Critic here. And this video was sponsored by me. Head by me. I mean you. If you're a patron anyway. Because this show is supported by viewers like you. So if you become a patron, you get to not only see this episode early, but access the Discord and all the new exclusive stuff like music nights, podcasts, and all the music I've got coming down the pipeline. Plus, you get half off on all music and movie requests on my Kofi site. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to patreon.com slash rapcritic and get in on the action. All right, y'all, let's talk about Shabuzi. The country rap hybrid sensation that's been sitting pretty at the top of the charts for eight weeks now. With a track that's got half the world line dancing right along to the unlikely fusion of styles, while the other half is asking... Hey, wait, wasn't the phrase country rap supposed to be a joke? Like, it's either a novelty gimmick sound that bro country artists threw in their music to replicate the sound of modern hip-hop without those pesky black people in it, or something black rappers did every so often as a silly extra production flair to make a track stand out. But here we all sit, uh, with the knowledge that an unironic contender for Song of the Year is a song that sounds like a genuinely seamless blend of the two wildly contrasting styles minus the awkward vibe that we usually get with it. And it's not necessarily like last time this happened with Lil Nas X. See, uh, that time you could say it was genuinely experimenting and pulling apart what a genre even is, uh, with its sample coming from a dark ambient EDM track and being sung wrapped over by someone with a southern accent to lean into the way the original instrument used in the sample could be recontextualized as a country tune. Nas X treated that moment as more of a stepping stone into a more genre-hopping career, listening to Shibuzi's catalog and looking at his album covers, it makes it seem like, nah, he's, he's pretty committed to the rapping cowboy bit. Is it my fault? You're lost. And honestly, I think the formula for what's making it resonate with such a large crossover audience comes down to one main thing. The track sounds like it's actually taking both genres seriously. Like, uh, let's be real, whenever you hear a white boy bro country track, it doesn't sound like guys who grew up wanting to MC while doing country music and trying to somehow blend the two. No, it, it's usually a producer who got in the singer's ear and told him to make the track sound more urban. And on the rap side of things, most of the rappers whose producers throw in a slide guitar in the production timeline, they, they don't actually listen to Willie Nelson or give a shit about the genre of country beyond familiarity with the stereotypical aesthetics. But with this track, the country sound doesn't feel tacked on. It feels like it was crafted by someone who had their heart moved by a country song, with this folksy stomping production and thoughtfully play strings and guitar arrangements. And on the hip-hop side of things, sure, he doesn't, you know, really rap that much, but what mainstream rapper really does these days, anyway? Nah, it's mostly singing for the first verse, with a bit of a sing-song rap cadence in the second. And sure, what's considered rapping these days is pretty nebulous, with a lot of modern rap including a layer of melody in the delivery, but before hip-hop as a genre came along, this technique was originally called Sprechstimme, which is classical music fancy speak for talk singing, where a musical line with a quick cadence would often be delivered in a spoken yet melodic way for effect, to puncture the artifice of a musical performance and make the listener really feel the emotional weight or intensity behind what's being said. But by now, we're so used to talk singing being a signifier for rap music, with hip-hop being such a universally recognized genre, it's just kinda how we perceive anyone who flows like that now. Plus, it helps when the artist is actually tuned into the genre to where they legit sound comfortable in the flow of what feels like a rap verse. And on top of that is the brilliantly flipped mid-2000s Jaquan sample. But whereas in the original song, the counting moments in the verse are used just as a filler line for the next rhyme, here it feels like it's being sampled as a reference to the number of shots he's taken. Like, oh, here comes the second to the third and the fourth, like they're all coming in rapid succession. Like, only someone who's well-versed in the language of hip-hop could have dug to pull a sample like that. But only someone well-versed in country would have had the technical ability to twist it in a way to make it sound like a legit barn burner of a country tune. And when you listen to the verses, it reveals just how similar the disparate genres really are, right down to lyrics about the struggles of the common clay downtrodden American just trying to get by, written mainly by a bunch of rich people putting on the aesthetics of the working class that they make music for. Like, yeah, rappers have to act like they still rep their hood and need to sell drugs to survive uh, despite being millionaires who can live anywhere, and country artists have to act like they're all living on dirt roads with pickup trucks and cowboy hats and yada yada yada. Because uh, while I do enjoy the song, it is still odd when lyrics like this pop out. My baby found a Birkin, she's been telling me all night long, there's a mean and gross. It's like, okay, so you're living a life worried about groceries and gas from month to month, but your girlfriend's bugging you for a bag that, from a casual Google search, on average costs tens of thousands of dollars? Either things aren't going as bad in your life as you're making them out to be, or your girlfriend's got some serious budgeting priority issues. Sure, I get it, he's playing on the girlfriend spending the guy's money trope, but a Birkin bag is just such a hyperbolic example. Like, just look at the average cost of one, these prices are fucking astronomical. I don't know, man. Maybe stop dating women that hang out with the fucking Kardashian sisters. You might have some extra change for yourself. 
I'm just saying, I mean, get you a coach bag, girl, and see how that changes things. Also, this line hit a little odd for me, too. Because usually people say you can't take it with you about things you like in life. Like, oh yeah, enjoy driving that car because, hey, can't take it with you. But saying, I don't worry about my problems because, hey, I can't take it with me when I die. Like, you shouldn't want to take your problems with you when you die, right? Or maybe he's saying it more apathetically, like, ah, I just don't let the stresses I'm dealing with bother me because, hey, <laughs> at least when I'm dead, I won't have to think about it at all anymore, right? Like, yeesh, that's some cold comfort, bro. Like, I'm sure he meant it as a mixture of both meanings in some fashion, but, you know, he, he just did that thing everyone sometimes does where, where you put a bit of a misheard twist on the common saying, but didn't really think about how the changed wording slightly rephrases the intention of what's being said. Because, on its face, it's saying, I don't worry about my problems, I won't need to care about them when I'm dead, it, 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 it kind of sounds like the sentiment of a person who's, you know, that's so apathetic about their life that they're, they're probably not interested in doing shit, like, at all, much less committing the willpower to work for the kind of money it would take to pay their bills and their girlfriend's expensive purse habits. But fuck it, dude, you know homeboy's at least four shots deep at this point, so I can get not having the strongest grasp on sentence structures. And maybe this is the visceral truth calling to the audience that hears the song, uh, seeking refuge in alcohol to dull your awareness of the brain-numbing reality that you're living life in a society incentivized by money that quantifies you as nothing more than what value it can extract from you. And, uh, oh my god, uh, someone played this up before I start thinking too hard about this myself. Also, it is funny to think of how this track contrasts with the original song. I mean, uh, this track is about being older and using alcohol to weather the stress of years and adult problems on your mind. The original was about, it, well... Ting drinking is very bad. Yo, I got a fake ID, though. Yeah, yeah. So whereas Jaquan's track rings like a teenage house party anthem that revels in being irresponsible, the new song is... Well, okay, I guess it's still pretty irresponsible drinking your worries away, but at the very least it feels earned as a respite from work and stress. Even if the rap trope of the expensive brand name drop feels like an odd opener for such a working class sounding anthem. But hey, you know, maybe he's a guy who's so caught up in keeping up with the Joneses, he keeps them on a cycle of their expenses matching their paycheck, uh, like most of us. There's a party downtown near Everybody had a Overall, I'd give it a 4 out of 5. It's a solid fun track that commits to its bit and balances the scales of nodding to both genres while still having fun without ever feeling outright hokey in either one. Of course, it's probably still being met with resistance from the country music industry gatekeepers just like Beyonce and Lil Nas X had to deal with, but with how much more casually frequent these genre crossovers keep happening, it's clear to everyone outside that bubble that genres being exclusive to certain crowds is an invention of division by those up top who want to keep their audiences nice and divvied up so they can figure out who they can market to more easily. Also, uh, racism. Yeah, you can thank Henry Ford and Joe McCarthy for that shit. Look it up when you have a minute. However, in this modern age of remix culture with people crossing over unconventional styles for fun, it's cool to see mainstream hits actively reflecting that dropping of musical boundaries. Well, that's the episode. And if you want to support the show, of course, that's ko-fi.com slash rapcritic for one-time donations where you can request live streams or reviews, and patreon.com slash rapcritic for ongoing payments where you can see episodes early, get half off on Kofi requests, and join the RC Discord to chat with me and fellow fans. And until next time, I'm the Rap Critic. You don't have to like my opinion, but this time I did like the basic bitch thing that everyone else also likes, because, you know, I, I, sometimes the mainstream gets it right, okay? Something wrong, we got stuff, the time we go, man, with a brand new